On behalf of the WOMED Institute, I am so happy to welcome you to this webinar on restorative justice. For those of you who may not know, the WOMED Institute is an educational institution that draws upon the principles of the Baha'i Faith um, to inspire sustained social change uh, for the common good, both from a spiritual and material perspective. We know that uh, so much can change politically, policy-wise, and they're absolutely necessary. But without a, a raised consciousness and change of heart and minds of people, a, a lasting change becomes very difficult. We need both angles to to really uh, take us to where we want to go, to, to have that world that we all envision. As we embark on the discussion of restorative justice with this amazing panel of educators, researchers, counselors, and student activists from the LA area, Los Angeles area, we're inspired to acknowledge the history, beliefs, and land of the indigenous people of this area who continue to inspire us with their spirit, constructive resilience, and constructive agency. We are uh, thinking of our uh, Kich, uh, Tongva, um, peoples of uh, Los Angeles, Chumash in uh, Ventura, uh, Hashaman uh, of South Orange County, and Luiseno of Riverside. And um, before introducing uh, the panel, well, the two that will start us off, I also wanted to um, uh, share a quote to kind of set uh, the spiritual atmosphere um, from Abdu'l-Baha, who, uh, whose name means uh, servant of glory. And he's the son of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith and spend a lot of time with his father in exile, imprisonment and so forth. So Abdul Baha says, the, bo the body politic is engaged day and night in devising penal laws and in providing for ways and means of punishment. It builds prisons, acquires chains and fetters and ordains places of exile and banishment, seeking thereby to reform the criminal. Whereas in reality, this only brings about the degradation of morals and the subversion of character. The body politic should instead strive night and day, bending every effort to ensure that souls are properly educated, that they progress day by day, that they advance in science and learning, that they acquire praiseworthy virtues and laudable manners, and that they forsake violent behavior so that crimes may never occur. He goes on to say, at the present time, and this was when he visited the United States in 1912, the contrary prevails. The body politic is ever seeking to strengthen penal laws, securing means of punishment, instruments of death and chastisement and places of imprisonment and exile, and then waiting for crimes to be committed. This has a most detrimental effect. And for those of you who were um, at the other webinar with uh, Dr. Derek Smith on the prison industrial complex, um, you know, had uh, an opportunity to, to really explore that together with us. He goes on to say, but if the masses were educated so that knowledge and learning increased day by day, understanding was broadened, perceptions were refined, morals were rectified and manners reformed, in a word that progress was made with respect to every degree of perfection, then the occurrence of crime would subside. As ignorance is the root cause of crime, the more knowledge and learning advance, the less crime will be committed. If we could only get this formula, <laughs> this quote is by Abdul Baha from Some Answered Questions. And now I have the pleasure to introduce um, my two colleagues. Unfortunately, I don't have the pleasure to introduce the whole panel because uh, it will be uh, kind of rolled out in stages. But um, 
My dear colleague, Ariane White, uh, I have known through uh, two means. One, the Paulo Freire Institute at UCLA, and also the um, Institute for Humane Education. Um, Ariane White has been an educator in the Los Angeles area t since 2003 and completed her doctoral research in Loyola Marymount University's Educational Leadership for Social Justice Program in 2019. Um, uh, and she did her dissertation um, on restorative justice in schools. She is a longtime member of AWARE LA, a community-based white anti-racist affinity group and serves as the uh, co-coordinator of AWARE LA's restorative culture team. In all her work, she aims to reframe conflict as an essential element of healing and relationships and transforming systems in service of equity and justice. And dear Ariane, I welcome you. You have done a lion's share of putting this panel together. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Chicha. So Dr. White is also joined by uh, Dr. Uh, Shadi Youssef, uh, Sayed Youssef, sorry. Um, Dr. Shadi has, uh, uh, is an uh, Iranian immigrant like myself. Uh, a woman with a disability and an activist based in Los Angeles. She has been an educator for more than 10 years and has taught middle and elementary school, finding particular joy in teaching young children how to read. She recently founded Love and Liberation Educational Consulting, focused on uh, doing the work of creating a better world for all through radical hope, revolutionary love, joyful resistance, and critical praxis. So without further ado, I turn it over to both of you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Chicha. We really appreciate being here. Um, and thank you to Shadi for screen sharing. You're saving my life right now. <laughs> so um, I wanted to, so the panelists and I wanted to share with you some key concepts as to how to frame this uh, discussion about restorative justice in schools. And so the guiding questions that we're going to start with are these, and, and we really encourage you to sit with them and have your own answers emerge and just be present with you. What do we value as individuals and as a society? What do we value? And how are our values expressed in how we relate to young people in schools? So today's discussion is going to be an opportunity to dig into these questions a little bit. And I wanted to share with you this definition of restorative justice. I know many of you are here learning about restorative justice for the first time. And there are many definitions of restorative justice and many ways of talking about it. So we're going to offer several ways of talking about this concept, this notion, this paradigm of restorative justice. And in my dissertation research that I did, this was my favorite definition that I found. So restorative justice promotes values and principles that use inclusive collaborative approaches for being in community. These approaches validate the experiences and needs of everyone within the community, particularly those who have been marginalized, oppressed, or harmed. These approaches allow us to act and respond in ways that are healing rather than alienating or coercive. So as we're thinking about restorative justice, we're really considering a paradigm shift. So what we know about justice as it currently stands is that it is definitely way more um, re retributive or punitive than it is restorative. Um, what I mean by that is that, for instance, uh, if a crime occurs, um, we think about it as a violation of the law and the state versus in restorative justice approach, um, we think about it in terms of the people that it's harmed and the relationships that have been harmed. Um, when we're thinking about um, 
what happens after someone commits a crime. Uh, we think about creating guilt or culpability, trying to get someone to, to own that as um, and be punished for it versus um, in restorative justice, we think about violations as creating obligations. So you've done such harm, that means that it is now your responsibility to fix that harm, that's your obligation. When we're thinking about um, how justice requires the state to determine blame in the traditional approach, we're thinking about some someone decides this is your punishment that is equal to the crime that you committed versus in restorative justice, we're really thinking about the people that have been harmed. So the survivors, um, the offenders and the community members who have all been harmed in some way because of whatever act that occurred that was harmful. And so you're really working to repair that harm and put things right. So it's a much more humanistic approach versus um, an approach that is looking just to um, blame people for a situation and then move on and say that they've, they've, just, they've already decided what that person's punishment is, so we no longer need to deal with it. Um, when we think about the traditional justice system, the victims' voices might be heard in order to um, find a punishment for, for the offender, you would call them, um, but it doesn't actually necessarily make the harmed person feel better in any type of way. Um, besides feeling possibly that, that uh, you know, tinge of revenge possibly, but that's not really the humanistic way to deal with situations of harm. So the central focus of traditional justice approaches are um, the offenders getting what they deserve versus in restorative justice, where we're really thinking about the survivor's needs and the offender's responsibility for repairing harm. Um, to give a very quick idea of what this might look like in the most simplest form. Say in, I teach elementary school, say in your classroom, um, a child comes and rips up another child's paper and throws it away. Well, in traditional justice approaches, we might say, um, oh, you are in trouble and you have to go and take a time out or, you know, you're not allowed to color today or something is taken away versus in restorative justice, you're really focusing on the child that was harmed, the one whose paper was ripped up um, and figuring out how the person who ripped their paper can help them make them feel better, um, genuinely feel better, not just apologize and walk away. So restorative justice is a much more humanizing approach um, that's also very life affirming and that is also very focused on making sure that we understand that people are not disposable. Um, and so that is is why it is such a powerful paradigm shift that we really need to commit to as, as a community. So now we're thinking about how this relates to schools, um, like my brief example, right? Well, we have some other wonderful people here with us. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about Kalila and Sarah to start us off in this conversation, um, as well as Tariq and Gretel. So, so we have with us Sarah, and Sarah Giotto is a senior at Dorsey High School, and she is a leader with Students Deserve. She's worked on a campaign to defund the Los Angeles School Police Department for much of her high school years, and she is a phenomenal um, speaker <laughs> that you're about to hear. So um, we're, we're very, very proud to be able to share um, some of our time with her in this in this experience. Um, I also want to introduce to you Kalila Williams, who is a senior at the Girls Academy uh, Academic Leadership Academy. She is a student and an organizer with Students Deserve as well, and also with uh, Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard. Um, so these are phenomenal young activists that are joining us today that we're very excited to hear from about how this work of restorative justice has impacted them in schools. Um, and then we'll also get to hear a little bit more from uh, Tariq Smith, who is the restorative justice coordinator at a middle school in Los Angeles. And his work um, supports young people in, in very, very amazing and inspirational ways. So we are very excited to hear from him as well. And last but not least, Ms. Gretel Vega, who is a psychiatric social worker for the Los Angeles Unified School District. She works within the clinic um, program providing individual and family therapy to students and parents experiencing high emotional distress. Gretel was born and raised in Los Angeles and attended a local public high school. So she is a uh, homegrown member of our of our panel here as well. Um, so I'd just like to open it up for you all to share a little bit more about how this work of restorative justice and this paradigm shift um, relates to schools and what you've experienced in schools. Um, I guess I'll start first. 
Um, so thank you for that wonderful introduction um, as well, Shadi. Um, so the work that we do, um, so I am a leader in Students Deserve, um, and we've organized around different um, problems for more than um, I can count for more years than I've actually been a part of um, the organization. Um, and within every campaign that we have ran, there has always been some restorative justice implementation within it. Um, beginning with when I actually started um, in the organization with random searches, um, Prior to me entering high school, I was randomly searched on my middle school campus. Um, and what random searches is, um, it was a policy that allowed for um, staff supervisors on campus to search students. Um, and they believed that it would, you know, prevent weapons on campus um, and promote overall safety for students. But the actual reality was that students were being targeted, specifically black, brown, Muslim youth. Um, and so I was called in a couple of times um, because I am black and Muslim. Um, and it was a traumatizing experience um, to have something that, you know, is very personal to you, like a backpack that holds, you know, not only books, notebooks, but also like your toiletries, things that you need for school um, and beyond. And so having that experience, again, was traumatizing. Um, I obviously did not like it. And a lot of students felt very uncomfortable. Um, and, and it honestly ruined the report on our campus. We did not trust the staff. We did not trust our teachers because the same people who would say that they care about us, that they care about our education, continue to violate us on a campus, on our campus, a place that we spend hours on. Um, and so um, once entering high school and I found that students were organizing to eliminate that, of course, I was prepared and ready for that. Um, and within the campaign, I learned how grave an effect it had on students and their learning. Um, and so what had happened was that even though we were pushing to eliminate random searches, we also wanted different implementations. Um, so we wanted, you know, community schools to be invested in um, and other practices to be um, invested in, such as counselors, because um, Dorsey, my campus, was in great need of counselors. Um, there was a deficit on our campus um, and we did not necessarily have relationships with the ones that would come in temporarily. Um, so we pushed for that um, and we ended up winning. Um, and, you know, our organizing have continued over the years with, you know, the banning of pepper spray, um, as well as the defund um, the school police campaign, which I'll pass off to Kalila to talk about more. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Shadi, um, and everyone here for this opportunity. Um, yeah, as Sarah said, in all of our movements within Students Deserve, we've always tried to incorporate a restorative justice strategy. Um, and so in the case with random ending random searches, we wanted to make sure that students weren't being over-policed, um, especially Black students, because um, that trigger of being searched uh, in your own school, somewhere you're supposed to feel safe, um, is overwhelming. And so we took that on and we wanted to make sure that students didn't have to feel that again, um, especially our black and brown students. And so then we came with, um, which that was our essential starting point for our defund um, the school pol L LA school police movement. Um, and what that means is we're divesting from criminalization and policing. So we're divesting from the school police. We spend $77 million on school police officers. Um, and it was time that, you know, students' education were put forth. Uh, there's a lot of students, especially in black and brown and low income communities who continue to be left without resources that they need to um, go on about their days. There's schools that don't have textbooks. There's schools that have um, like textbooks from 1980s. Like they can't learn with uh, things like that, but they also can't learn without mental health counselors and full-time nurses and full-time academic counselors. Um, and they can't learn with the police officer on their campus because that just increases the, that just instills the fear that they feel outside of their classroom. Um, so we ha we really took a look at that. And um, when we started our campaign, um, 
it was so people understood that when we say divest from school police, we mean we're divesting from criminalization and investing into our students' education, investing in those students who don't have those resources, investing in community schools like Dorsey and Crenshaw. Um, I was pleased to go to uh, GALA, Girls Academic Leadership Academy, and we have many resources that other schools don't have. Um, we have three full-time uh, uh, counselors. We may not have a full-time nurse, but we have counselors. We have um we have assistance um, and updated books. We have everything that we would need to continue with our education compared to other schools. And so I've seen the difference on how you, when you have the actual opportunities at one school and then you don't at another, how that can really affect things. But we can't keep picking and choosing which schools need resources um, here in our school district. We need to start focusing on all students and all students should be um, prioritized, especially black students. Um, and so with that, like, yeah, like restorative justice is something that we implemented in our defund LA school police campaign. We said um, that money that we're divesting from school police, that's going to go into restorative justice strategies. That's going to go into our community schools. Um, and so recently in June, we defunded the school police by $25 million, which is a 35% cut. It was the largest cut ever made to the LA school police department. And we will continue to fight for more cuts. Um, but for this start, we are definitely working hard. It's, we've been, me and Sarah have been working and meeting with uh, the superintendent and school board members to try to make sure that that $25 million goes into black students, pri um, prioritizes black students, and we implement restorative justice strategies within those schools so that they're not being policed and criminalized. Instead, um, that they're getting the resources that they need. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Kalila and Sarah, for breaking that down so thoroughly. And if we can go to the next slide, I want to just back us up a little bit to look at the big picture, because what they've just described from their own lived ex experiences is well documented in the research as to what has been happening um, for the past few decades in terms of the expansion of a presence of policing and surveillance in schools. Um, um, and the implementation of policies like zero tolerance, tolerance disciplinary practices, where even for very minor offenses like using a cell phone when they weren't supposed to, a student can receive an out of school suspension. So what we have inherited in this current moment is the impact of decades of these types of policies, including policies like the random search in schools policy that Kalila and Sarah and the students deserve and the students not suspects uh, coalition as a whole were instrumental in transforming and changing and abolishing that policy. But it goes back to that very quote that Chitra started us out with, which is, you know, to what extent are we waiting for crimes to be committed? Like, is that how we want to relate to young people in schools? Is that a good match for our values? Right. And so um, the work that these young people are doing is reversing the trends of the last several decades, which tried to characterize black and brown young people as super predators. That was the most popular term used in the tough on crime era in the 1990s when that first kind of picked up. So just keeping that in mind. And, and you know, there are many, many statistics here, too many to read on the slide in terms of you know, 95% of all school suspensions are for relatively minor infractions. The fact that over 70% of those suspensions are um, Black and Latinx students that are being suspended. So looking at the racial disparities in terms of how zero tolerance pol policies are being implemented in our schools across the board, and, and many have termed this the school to prison pipeline because of the correlation between 
a lack of a successful schooling experience, lack of ability to graduate from high school, being linked to later um, involvement with the criminal legal system. So that's the work that these young people are really trying to interrupt and transform and change with all of the things that they're asking for and all of the, the, the things that they um, are demanding in terms of um, changes to our school environment. Thank you, Ariane. Um, I'd like to even add to that, that not only school to prison, but also preschool to prison, because we know that in our work, what, working with very young kids, that children as young as even three years old are getting suspended or even um, handcuffed for, you know, the things that they're doing as children um, in, in their school setting. So I think that's also something to name. Um, <clears throat> so when we're talking about the accountability structure of um, what it means to work restoratively with students or with even with your children in terms of parenting. Um, you can think about it as in terms of how much control there is or how much structure there is versus how much support um, that is available as well. So if you are um, or a teacher is or a school is um, looking at things from a, a perspective where there's a low level of support and a low level of structure, which is something that we see in a lot of our schools, um, that is a neglectful paradigm because in, in that sense, you're not caring for the people that are in your care. You are the adults and you're not supporting, um, nourishing the, the children that have been grant, granted in your care. When you're thinking about it in terms of um, how it can become authoritarian, then it's, it's a more punitive system. So that's what we actually see in a lot of our um, black and brown schools predominantly is because this, this idea of this need to control black and brown bodies leads to um, this punitive lens of where it is not necessarily supportive, but it's very, very structured. Um, and that's how we've seen a lot of a lot of systems like no excuses schools come into um, effect is because they think that children who are from these communities or these backgrounds or historically marginalized places need this high level of structure in order to be successful, but they're not actually supporting the students, they're just controlling them. Um, when you're thinking about it in a paternalistic lens, um, there's a high level of support, but a low level of structure. So in that sense, um, what's happening is that you're kind of just letting folks just run free and telling them that like you love them and everything's great, but not actually supporting them to have the kinds of structures that they would need to be successful. So when we're looking at it from the restorative lens, um, that's a more authoritative lens. So you are still acting as a guider, a facilitator and supporting them. Um, but you are also, um, have, have some sense of structure as well. So we think of that as a high level of structure as well as a high level of support. Um, and so when, when you're approaching it that way, then anytime something happens um, and discipline needs to happen, because we should know that discipline doesn't mean punishment, discipline means teaching. When you think of discipline, you think of disciple and disciple comes, you know, discipline comes from the word disciple, which just means a learner. So um, when you're thinking about how to approach working with young people, um, in an authoritative way when you are still, you still have wisdom and knowledge to share with them, but you're not punishing them, you're teaching them and guiding them to learn their own lessons in that way. So that is what this is, um, this shift is talking about in, in moving towards a restorative approach. <clears throat> and so in schools, there are, there are a continuum of strategies that can be utilized um, when you're thinking about what you could, could be doing at, even at home or at school with, with young people. Um, so we think about the language that's used. These are the informal strategies that could be used. There's, there's language choices, um, such as affective questions, where you are saying, you're asking questions like, what happened? Um, what made you do that? Um, how, how are you feeling when that happened? How do you think the other person was feeling? And you're asking both the person who was harmed as well as the person who, um, created the harmful situation. And so instead of shouting or, um, you know, uh, punishing or telling them, telling them what they did wrong and what they need to apologize for, instead, you're asking a set of guiding questions um, and using I say, 
asking for I statements to talk about the impact of different experiences. Um, there's also circles that you could be having where you're just allowing everyone to have equal voice uh, within your community and allowing um, allowing all of the members of your community to have opportunities to share about, you know, different topics, including what, what things make them feel good and also what things have um, made them feel harm. So it depends on the kinds of circles that you're having. Um, you might also have some collaborative problem solving sessions uh, where you're talking about a situation that might have occurred and how you can work together to fix that. And this is moving towards the more um, formal um, approaches. So the informal you can do at any time. Um, circles you can have every day versus the more formal is when you ha actually have to have a mediation or restorative meeting. Um, and I'm sure Tariq has a lot more to share about this as a, uh, as a practicing um, RJ person at his school, if you would like to chime in as well, Tariq. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Shadi. Uh, it's great to be here. I think um, as a practicing RJ teacher, um, I, think, I think the word that just keeps coming to mind as I listen this morning and really enjoying what everybody's saying, especially our student speakers, is the concept of vulnerability and like all of the various ways that we can interpret that word. Um, and when we think about the children who need RJ most in schools, it's probably our most vulnerable children. Um, and when we think about what we want in our learners in schools, it is like the ability or the freedom or the safety to be vulnerable. And that really does not exist unless you have uh, some type of community that you've established that allows learners, students to take risks, to feel safe enough, right, to be vulnerable. And so I think when I think of myself as an RJ practitioner, I'm thinking about um, really creating a sense of community that has enough uh, permanence and elasticity to it that, um, that children who are vulnerable can feel safe enough to participate in that. Uh, community building circles are a huge part of that process, but I think I think really for me, I think about it in terms of like even managers or bosses that I've had that have helped me, you know, perform the best. And it's really not the people who, you know, rule over me with the iron fist or who are always trying to catch me slipping or making a mistake. It's people that believe in me, people that encourage me, people that just start with the positive presupposition. And, you know, there's a lot of like fancy ways you can describe uh, restorative justice, but I feel like that's what the restorative part of it is, is that really like, I believe in you and I'm going to approach you uh, in a way that demonstrates that belief. And when we think about our most vulnerable kids in our marginalized communities, that's really, I think, a large part of what they need. Obviously, they need resources <laughs> and funding and everything else that is, uh, that would help be and that's, I guess that's where the justice part comes in, right? That uh, if, if we do have justice in our communities, then schools are funded in the way that they should be. Um, but yeah, I could, I could go on and on forever. But I think, you know, I think if there's a concept I want to put across, it's the idea of like how we think about vulnerability, especially when we think about that image of the super predator and how black kids specifically, but children of color are framed as a, uh, criminals, violent, unable to be children, and definitely not really in need of protection or second chances or nurturing and care. Um, so that's where I, that's that's how we keep talking ourselves in all this punitive stuff when when really we're still raising children, right, in schools. So when I think of restorative, that's kind of what comes to mind for me. And uh, I guess at some point later, I can talk about the justice part, which is just as important. Thank you so much, Tariq. I want to make space and invite Gretel if there's anything you'd like to share from, from what we've shared so far before we dive into this one final uh, conceptual piece. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, uh, you know, Sarah said something, said a word that 
just like hit me so hard because I think I've been focusing or we've been talking about this idea and thanks to one of my colleagues, actually, it's stayed with me for a while, you know, the idea of being um, connection driven versus being compliance driven. And I think we see students um, in our communities in that way, you know, young people, you know, we want young people to be compliant. You know, we just want them to, to follow these rules and do what they're supposed to do, right? And that removes the connection. But Sarah said a word, um, rapport, which I think is so important, right? Because that connection, that helps to build. Um, and if we have that with our students, if we are able to, to foster that, then, um, you know, that's the restorative part. That's, the, that's where we are able to get people to move. That's where we're able to have um, space, hold space for, for folks to be vulnerable, like Tariq said, you know, to be able to, to feel safe enough, to feel comfortable enough to, to be vulnerable. Um, and so I think that there's, there's a huge focus and, and that's the paradigm shift in, in my work, right? Um, as a psychiatric social worker, as a mental health therapist, um, where I'm not focusing or I, I don't want my students to be necessarily just compliant to everything, you know, that is, is forced on them. You know, I, I want to make sure that they're able to build the connection, that they're able to feel um, that they have that space um, to be vulnerable. And, and there's that paradigm shift that needs to happen where we're not focusing on, on that compliant part where we're focusing on them um, being connection driven, you know, and so. Thank you for that, that's so powerful. And this final image here that I just wanted to flash and share with, with you all is um, you can picture that continuum from the previous slide and you can picture it kind of tilting on its side. And so the um, all of the informal practices, the community building, the rapport building, the relationship building, all of that is the foundation for everything else that may need to happen. And I think so often, you know, maybe because we have like, because true crime stories are so popular, I don't know why, but we focus on like, well, what happens if this happens? And we go to the worst case scenario. And what this pyramid describes and what it portrays is that, you know, hopefully the vast majority of issues, potential harms, potential conflicts can be addressed in a preventative ma manner um, and can get at the root causes of the struggles before they manifest in these really intense ways. So intense intervention after harm has happened is actually a small, small, small piece of what restorative justice in schools actually looks like. Um, and one of the pieces that I have to uplift because um, it was just such a running thread in my dissertation from the restorative justice practitioners that I spoke with is we need to really be thinking about what are the structures and systems and infrastructures and how do we manage our time? What are the things that are necessary in order to really embrace this paradigm shift? It does not work to simply tell a teacher who is already overworked and stressed and, you know, bound by all these, you know, restrictions and requirements and state standards and high state testing and all of these things to all of a sudden drop everything and sit in a circle. That's a setup to fail. And that's unfortunately how restorative justice has been mostly implemented in schools as a setup to fail. What we need are schools and, and communities that are asking those deeper questions. How do young people learn? What do young people need? What are the things, what are the, and to Tariq's point about justice, what are the basic needs that are not being met? And that could be met um, if we were very clear about our values and how those manifest um, in our structures, our, how we spend our time in schools and our school budgets. So at this point, I think we want to, uh, turn it to, I don't know if teacher has anything to say, but I believe we're going to be launching a poll related to this question, to what extent does our school budget reflect our values? And Boyd is going to help with that. Boyd, um, I'll turn it over to you to do it. So it looks like the poll is up, which is great. Thank you. And there's just a couple of statistics that we invite you to consider. Ariane, maybe go ahead and just, if you'd like to read it out loud. And, sure. Yeah. 
So the first question, the Los Angeles School Police Department made 3,389 arrests while issuing 2,724 citations and 1,282 diversions between 2014 and 2017. Less than 9% of the Los Angeles student population are Black. What percentage of Black youth were involved in total? That's the first question. So feel free to make your choice when you are ready. The second one, about what percentage of boys of color were involved in those 7,395 youth arrests, citations, and diversions? Please make your best guess. And how many elementary and middle school age youth were arrested of the 3,389? So we'll invite you to make your selections and maybe Boyd can let us know when most participants have participated. And then I'll turn it over to Sarah and Kalila to tell us a little bit more. Of course, at this moment, we're missing Nikki and her um, wonderful vibe of getting people to fill in their answers. <laughs> the Jamaican vibe of getting people to to answer quickly, but we'll give everybody a minute before um, Ariane can share the results. Or I'm sorry, uh, I think Sarah and, and Sarah mm -hmm. are gonna do that. And we we need some more help over here, guys. So let's let's grab that poll because we want to see what you all think. Uh, for all of our friends that are watching on YouTube and Facebook, um, unfortunately, this poll doesn't go over there. But you can write your answers in the comment box in each of those. And we're going to close the poll here in about 10 seconds. All right. How's that sound, everybody? And five, four, three, two, one and a half, one. And we're going to end the poll. And if you want to read out the polls results. Sarah, Kalila, we're, I'll turn it over to you. Are you seeing the results? I'm not. Um, yeah, I think we don't see the results. Oh, uh, there they are. Oh, okay. okay, there Thank they you. are. Um, Thank you, Boyd. So this question asks about the arrest citations and diversions within L um, the LA School Police Department. And as we see, 9% um, of the student population of LAUSD is Black. Um, but the percentage of youth that were involved in total um, was actually, um, they were over policed more than their uh, population. Um, the correct answer is 25%. And then what about the second question? Oh, I didn't know if like, could we, oh yeah. Yeah, um, could it be scrolled up, boy? Oh yeah, sorry, I was, I forgot. You'll have to, to do that yeah. at each of your like, own. Mm. Yeah, I just realized that, sorry. Um, and then for the percentage of boys of color who were involved in these, um, in the total of youth arrest citations and diversions, 75% were youth of color. So both Latinx and um, black and uh, youth, youth were um, the main ones uh, involved in the school police citations, diversions, and arrest from that time period. Um, and then um, how many elementary and middle school aged youth were arrested of the uh, 3,389? And it's actually one in four a youth of color, specifically in elementary and middle school aged youth. Um, so just think about those numbers when you really look at things. If we're eight, if we're eight nine percent of the population, and we're being policed twenty five percent, if we well, if we're twenty five percent of the school police, um, I arrest diversions. And citations, if we're being policed starting elementary and middle school, 
students who don't really know what they're doing yet are getting criminalized and already starting to funnel this pipeline. Um, this pipeline of the um, where they're they essentially are being criminalized at such a young age for doing li the littlest things and it leads to that them being further criminalized in the future um within the prison system and so um sarah if you want to touch base on this some more yeah so um beyond the results that we've gotten from um the data provided by a million dollar hood we also did our own research um amongst students um and i think the results that kalila just went over are mm -hmm. essentially a reflection of what soci how society um treats people of color um and that is horribly um and you know the way that we are treated in school, again, is a reflection of how society treats us. So beyond that, if we want to touch on the experiences of LUSD students specifically, when doing our own research, we found that um, girls and gender non-conforming folks were being or had negative experiences with police um, at high rates. So is that surprising? Not necessarily, because in society, women and gender non-conforming or queer people are treated horribly. Um, and we know that the systems that are in place within schools are rooted in anti-queerness, are rooted in anti-blackness, and it must be stopped. So when the school board is investing within practices that are essentially abusing kids um, or hurting them in any, any kind of way, we know that, you know, that that is a problem and there there needs to be some kind of change in there and that there needs to be some reinvestment within us and actually prioritizing um the student achievement um and redefining what that means because it's not all just good grades it's not all paying attention in class and following what the teacher says uh, because believe it or not children have lives outside of being a student to students um uh, sorry children have Again, sorry, let me repeat. Children have lives outside of being a student. They also have different values. They have different cultures. They come from different people. So when you have all of that and you are going into school with different, again, values, people, you know, there needs to be some sort of accommodation for that. Um, and it's not going to be one size fits all. Different children have different needs. Um, and, you know, that needs to be, be provided within schools. So, yeah. Thank you so much, ladies, for your wonderful insights. I know you all have done tons and tons of research around this um, and really done a lot of the legwork um, that led to some of those results we saw in LAUSD. So thank you so much. Um, so as we are wrapping up our informational section of this time, um, we just want to name our goals for, for what we as restorative justice practitioners believe and, and students um, believe should be happening with this paradigm shift. Um, so we want to transform the paradigm for how conflict is addressed in schools and in broader communities. So yes, we're talking today specifically about how this has impacted schools, but we're also talking about um, how this impacts the, the legal justice system, because as we know, we call it the school to prison pipeline, right? So at some point, um, the prison industrial complex is also involved. Um, when we're talking about we want to talk, we want, one of our goals is to develop the skills and relationships that help prevent harm and conflict. Um, and that is amongst the adults that are working with youth as well as the youth themselves. And we want to foster equity, democracy, and wellness in schools and in communities. So really moving towards a more humanizing approach, really moving towards a more um, life-affirming approach and making sure that um, we are seeing the value of humanity and um, working to uplift that versus working to stifle it. So now we would like to go ahead and um, hand the mic back over to Chitra for some questions she might have um, for all of us, as well as um, if you all want to continue adding questions to the um, question box. Thank you so much, Shadi, and the rest of the panel for your insightful comments. Um, I see in the chat box, people are so uh, much enjoying the 
the uh, conversation and the insights. I wanted to just share for those who are watching on um, our Facebook page or YouTube page, um, your questions can't be taken there. Uh, I, I mean, you would have to put it in the comment box and then it'll make its way over here. I'm glad we don't have too many questions in the Q&A right now because um, uh, we, we do have one more, a couple more things to, to cover, but I do want to encourage the questions. Please have them come in as we're covering this part. To bring the panel uh, discussion to a close, I wanted to ask you all um, for your vision of um, what you would want schools to be like. What kind of values need to be there from your perspective? I so appreciated um, the concepts, the um, uh, outlook, and the lived experiences you shared. So if you want to share anything else about your experience and your vision for the future, uh, we'd love to have um, your comments now. I mean, definitely, because I got involved in this work. and A little, um, a little think, bit louder, Kalula. Thank you. Sorry. I mean, definitely, um, because I got involved with Students Deserve and Black Lives Matter Youth Vanguard after I had my own experiences with the school police, um, where I was um, at a school event, and I had passed out due to dehydration, and the school police officer accused me of having a drug overdose. Um, and... For me, I've always been in leadership. I've always been that person, you know, trying to avoid all of that. I've always, you know, uh, stood out at my school so that, like, because I thought if I did this and I did that, then I would never be accused of this or that. And to see that, it really um, put a change into perspective on how I viewed the school police. Um, and then when I got involved with Incidents Deserve and we started to fight for... Um, this this uh, movement, the defunding LA school police movement, when you really look at that as a whole, it's more than just about um, it's more than just about looking at how our society is right now and how they treat black youth, but it's also looking at how our society has always treated black youth because school police are instilled from a value of police officers and police officers have always instilled fear in black people because of the way that they have continued to criminalize and harm us over the past 400, 500 years. Um, they've dated back from modern slave catchers. That's where this was all or, um, originated. And now we have our modern day slave catchers, which is just um, this form of policing, um, as well as the prison industrial complex. These are all forms of anti-Blackness because th that's basically what our society is saying. It's okay to normalize something, um, but that isn't okay for everyone. And we've seen that happen many of times within the Jim Crow laws, within segregation, within slavery. And we continue to we continue to see society normalizes things that harm black people. And policing is just another form of that. The prison industrial complex is just another form of that. Um, and so when we look at that, when we are saying we want restorative justice, it's not just to say that, you know, yes, we need resources, but it's also to look at it as a whole, to look at to, um, how black youth, black individuals are being treated um, and how they've always been treated. And so when we look, when we look at, um, when we look at how society normalizes things, we see that everything was always against black people. So yes, when you hear defund the school police, that might not be something that you're used to hearing. That might not be something that is normalized, but that is because society is not going to normalize it because what we normalize is anti-Blackness. What we normalize is things that harm Black people. And it is okay to not understand things in a whole as soon as you know society starts to begin to talk about it. Um, and we've seen that happen when we started this movement. Like, oh my God, defund the school police. You, you, who's going to keep our kids safe and defund the police? Oh my God, like we're this nation's going to be left in harms and all this um, what was like arose. But where when we when we talk about this, we're not talking about we're not talking about something that is 
is normal. We're not talking about something that goes with society standards. Because if it goes with society standards, we we wouldn't be looking at it in general because it, the fact that this affects Black people is the reason why this isn't normal. The fact that, you know, this is something to support Black people is the reason why this is norm, is, isn't is normal. Um, and so when that's why when we say to look at everything as a whole and be able to invite new perspectives in is why this is so important because if you, because we all need um, everyone here and everyone in society needs to be able to create that new framework within themselves where they're able to take on new perspective of things, things that weren't considered normal, things that aren't considered normal and that we can still envision in society because reimagining public safety, reimagining school safety is for the greater good of everyone, especially black people. And it's time after years and years and years of society putting us down, of normalizing things that go against us, of normalizing anti-blackness, of normalizing chaos, that we really took that into our own hands and look at this new framework and look at this new perspective. Restorative ju justice can and will work, but we have to be willing to implement this. We have to be able to accept this new perspective because this is not something that society wants to implement because it's not something that we've ever normalized. But that is okay, because we know that things that have been normalized were not okay. And it's time that we start to look at that whole new um, framework. So when we talk about this, please also um, think of this in a new framework, think of this in a new perspective as well. Wow, I think I'm going to join Tariq, who says I'm, I'm going to move out of the way. <laughs> for the student activists to, to now lead the way. You guys are amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, to be sure that we have time to, to address some of these questions, um, I'm going to go ahead and take two. Um, I'm so exhilarated, uh, really, by this panel. Um, Okay, so the first question, uh, a group of us in Bend, Oregon, um, have recently completed eight hours of training uh, to be restorative justice facilitators in middle and high schools. We're looking for ways to practice what we've learned before going into schools. Are there any rehearsal tools that you have found um, productive? Would anybody like to briefly comment on that? I mean, I would love to hear from Gretel or Tariq if you have any ideas or insights given your uh, work in schools currently, like what's the best way for someone who's maybe looking to do this work in schools as an adult, like how can they do that? Um, I think, wow, the idea of rehearsing before, I mean, I think in education we're always kind of, you know, building the plane as we're flying it, they always use that metaphor right um I, I don't know how to avoid that in some ways um but i do think that the first thing that educators should do is to begin to practice um the principles themselves right uh to to figure out how to embed the circle processes into their everyday work and into their pds into their own living and being. Um, I think that data is also super important place to start. Um, really looking at your discipline data, really looking at your school data and figuring out who are the students that are being pushed out or marginalized in any kind of way and like really taking honest stock and how to address that. I think the expectation is um, is that is that uh, sorry lost my train of thought there for a second but the expectation is that students are supposed to just figure out how to navigate the gap between their needs and what schools are actually providing and it really obviously should be the other way around right schools are the places with the resources so 
I think that's the place to start. Um, there's also a really, there's tons of great books out there, but one that I recommend is uh, Circle Forward. I'll put that in the chat in a second. It's a, it's thick, <laughs> but it's also really uh, usable. It has circles for every type of situation that you can possibly imagine and a really uh, humanistic and social justice oriented approach to, to this work. Um, and so I think that's, that's also a good place to start is really just grounding yourself in the literature and, and uh, starting there. I think too, um, what Tariq was saying as well, um, one of the main things for me is authenticity, right? I, I think that students really pick up when adults aren't like actually down or, or don't really understand them or aren't there for them in an authentic way. And it's all performative. So when you ask about, you know, rehearsing prior to, there's not really a way to necessarily rehearse um, you know, an intervention, in my opinion, because, you know, you can, you can role play, you can, you can do all these um, specific techniques, you know, um, but I think when it's, when it's down to it, and you're in the room and in the circle with a student or, or you know, implementing, um, it's really about being authentic and, and really, you know, opening your heart to, to what's, what's going on in the room. So I, mm -hmm. I think that's a big thing for me. Mm -hmm. So true. Also, I think, um, oh, Shadi, were you going to say something? I'm just going to add one more thing, if that's okay. Too. Please, absolutely, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add that in terms of, um, I also saw that they said that uh, they're not they're not the teachers in the school, they're, they're facilitators going in. Um, so I would say, like, it really depends on the relationships, right? So all of this work depends on relationships. So you can't just be a person who's just going in to implement this. It has to be, um, it has to be a shift in the school culture. So I think it really takes getting all of the, um, all the other educators that are the teachers in the school on board as well, because otherwise it'll turn into um, this kind of under kind of like thinking where like you're the nice person versus like, no, this like humanizing work that you're doing. Um, so because, because people so often seek punishment. Um, so I think it definitely needs to be work that is done with the adults first and really thinking about like the, the adults identities, how that work impacts their work in the classroom. Um, and then also thinking about, if in terms of like practicing something, it, this is, it has to be authentic, like Gretel said, so you can't necessarily practice, but I would offer um, thinking about like one of, one of the most harmful situations that you feel like you've had, one of the most harmful interactions maybe that you feel like you've had e either as a young person or with um, in like as the adult facilitator in the space and thinking about how that could have been different had you approached it from a more restorative sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you. Yes, please. Um, yeah, sorry. I just want to touch also on that point of like, you know, where the outsiders, where the, where community members, who are outsiders when we look at that, because even us as students, when we go to the school board, we're called outsiders and we go to that school, we go to that school district, we go to schools within that school district. Um, you, you're saying that you're an outsider and that's why it's hard to contribute to um, this as like a whole, but also your opinion is greater being a being because yes, you may not be inside the classrooms. Yes, you may not be inside schools, but you don't necessarily have to be a teacher to speak up is if you're speaking up and you're talking about what you know is right from wrong and what you want to see in your schools, you as a community member are important. We there. That's why when we say like engage, that's engaging in many different ways. That's engaging in all ways that you can. That's speaking up, that's attending uh, school board meetings, that's doing so many different things because there's no such thing as being an outsider and not being able to contribute. Because you can always contribute and you don't have to necessarily be a teacher because it's those community members that we're looking for when we talk about these restorative justice practices. It's those community members that we want to see in our schools actually helping and preventing um, crime and um, starting to um, uh, help us implement these strategies. Because without those community members, this idea wouldn't be possible. 
Can I just add a little bit onto that? I love what <laughs> Kalila is saying. And just, yeah. I think that it's really in a, I, my, my oldest son is a community organizer around environmental justice. And, you know, he spends most of his time community mapping and learning the needs of the people who are not able to have voice. And I think, you know, I think as an outsider, that's probably a good place to start is really community mapping and schools really are communities in and of themselves, right? And you're gonna find the teachers that have kids in their room at lunch and are staying after school and working with the kids that nobody else wants to work with. And you really wanna deputize those students to pick up the work, you know, or those teachers, those adults, you know, who are already about uh, helping those most marginalized and most needy students, you know, that the other teachers are like, I can't work for this kid, ah, you know. And so if you really, if you really spend the time learning the needs of the school and learning who those people are, you will be shocked at how far they can carry the work and how much um, energy and, and movement that that can generate. Absolutely. And I thank you so much for those responses. I think that um, maybe hearing about some more of the resources will help answer some of the other questions that, that have arisen. So um, if you would please go ahead and, and start this section and then uh, we'll end with uh, some final words. Perfect. Thank you, Chitra. So this slide depicts um, some amazing students from an organization called Students Deserve that Sarah and Kalila are both a part of. And they are on the front lines trying to make change, making it happen. They've already had some amazing wins um, and they're looking for more, more ways of transforming our school communities, more ways of reallocating those resources in ways that are actually supporting the most vulnerable students and those whose needs have not yet been met in schools. And I just want to underscore that question of like, what do I do? How do I get involved? We each have our own work to do. We each have our own healing to do. And I know for myself as a white person and as an educator, I've had a lot of unlearning to do related to how uh, systemic racism is baked into every institution that we are a part of. So Aware LA has been my home for doing that work. You are welcome to join. Um, and also the Alternatives to Violence Project is an incredibly useful space to learn and practice and skill build and support others in developing um, ways of making change and ways of being in the world that are uh, that promote justice and that promote equity. Um, so we encourage you to get involved. Um, for those who are interested specifically in a deep dive into restorative justice, a really fabulous organization called CCEJ is offering a restorative justice immersion experience. And for right now, everything is virtual. So it's accessible, at least in that way, um, for, for people uh, across a wide or geographic area. So that's coming up. Check out this, the uh, CACEJ.org is their website. Check them out for this as well as other offerings. And then here's a list of our favorite resources that I believe the Wilmette Institute will uh, post and make available to you. And we will also share these slides with those who have registered. Um, so you'll be able to have access to these things. Uh, we wish we had more time to talk about all of them, but these are just some of the, of the, uh, of the works that have informed our practice and that continue to inspire our work. So I wanna pass to Shadi and Gretel to close out the panelists so much. So this is a Mayan um, poem, an affirmation that um, we often use in a lot of restorative spaces as well as classrooms, and it's called En La Quetch. Um, so Gretel and I will read it together, and we also invite you all to read along with us. Tell me, give me a thumbs up when you're ready, Gretel. <laughs> <laughs> en La Quetch. Tú eres mi otro yo. You are my other me. Si te hago daño a ti. If I do harm to you. Me hago daño a mí mismo. I do harm to myself. Si te amo y respeto. If I love and respect you. Me amo y respeto yo. I love and respect myself.
Thank you to each and every member of this panel for this enlightening uh, presentation. I know it'll be viewed many times over. Um, I also wanted to just um, share a few comments, you know, about, uh, you know, a few of the things that has been shared. And one that I feel is so central, and that is anti-Blackness. And uh, what Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, says um, in, in his writings, as you know, that, you know, he, he was um, in prison and exiled for 40 years. And in one of his writings, he says that um, people of African descent, Black, is as the pupil of the eye through which the spirit shineth forth to that effect. I hope that I, I have the quote right. But um, from a socio-historic theological perspective, humanity has to change its uh, worldview on blackness and see it as the spirit that will help humanity attain its ultimate destiny of unity. Because without unity, we cannot do the work that we need to do to bring justice. That justice and unity are two sides of the same coin. And so um, I'm so inspired by each of you and your work. I feel privileged to be with you here today. Um, also invite you to the resources in the Wilmette Institute. We have uh, anti-Black racism in the US and building a unified society course that fills up caps at 100 three times in, in 2020. So. Um, that is also a wonderful thing to share with others, um, also the webinars and so forth. And we look forward to continuing to collaborate together to work towards uh, social justice and the world we want to see. So again, thank you. And I will close out with this ending quote. Divine civilization, however, so traineth every member of society that no one with the exception of a negligible few, will undertake to commit a crime. There is thus a great difference between the prevention of crime through measures that are violent and retaliatory and so training the people and enlightening them and spiritualizing them that without any fear of punishment or vengeance to come, they will shun all criminal acts. They will indeed look upon the very commission of crime as a great disgrace and itself the harshest of punishments. They will become enamored of human perfections and will consecrate their lives to whatever will bring light to the world and will further those qualities which are acceptable at the holy threshold of God. See then how wide is the difference between material civilization and divine. With force and punishments, material civilization seeketh to restrain the people from mischief, from inflicting harm on society and committing crimes. But in a divine civilization, the individual is so conditioned that with no fear of punishment, he shunneth the perpetration of crimes, seeth crime itself as the severest of torments, and with alacrity and joy setteth himself to acquiring the virtues of humankind, to furthering human progress, and to spreading light across the world. Selections from the writings of Abdul Baha. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, wishing you a wonderful 2021 and many more opportunities for collaboration. Thank you. Take care, everyone.